Okay, uh, Dr. Koh, we put up a few of your books up here. Good, good background. Um, and uh, I, I've only had a chance to go through the pictures on, on this one. A lot of beautiful stuff. It's basically a picture book. Yeah, especially it's, it's, yeah. a lot of beautiful. How did you, how did you decide on the photographer uh, to, to do your, your book? Well, the you mean the cover of this one? No, it was the, the book altogether. Altogether. Well, the, the 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 photographer. He's a he's from the Bay Area. Barry Brukoff, a wonderful photographer, and he had uh, done a book like this uh, on Angkor in Cambodia, and so since I have written a book on Angkor, actually two now, uh, I was contacted to see if. He, they w he and I would do a book together, uh, but on the Maya. Mm -hmm. And he's always been wild about the Maya, too, much more than about Encore. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, and I loved the, what he did with, with Encore. I said, okay. And uh, we made uh, several trips down to see a lot of Maya sites that I had never seen before. Honest to goodness. I'd I, I haven't been to every Maya site. You know, you the, <laughs> right. well, there's only about two or three thousand of them, yeah, yeah. but uh, it was fun, really. And uh, uh, we had a graduate student with us, uh, who uh, American graduate student, who really knew these these places. He could tell that the, when the sun was perfect on such and such a building, you know, what time we had to get there uh, to go to another place. He knew all of this stuff. Gotta, so he was our local, our local contact. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, really, doing that. Have you had a chance to go to Ekbalam? Ekbalam, uh, which I'd never been to before. And that was a wonderful sight. Yeah. yeah uh, we went there in November when we were hoping to meet up with you. And when we got there, it was, it was very different from most sites. We haven't been to It's a, It's a strange site. It's it, not it like is. any other site. Did you go to uh, the, what do they call it, the pool? The cenote that they had there? Uh, I heard about it, but I saw it, but I didn't go into it. But. Oh, okay, but you got to see it, yeah. I know it. Yeah. We didn't have that, that long there, but uh, yeah. what uh, the real problem for the photographer was that uh, up on top of the main structure there, the sort of palace structure, yeah. uh, the, what the uh, Maya glyphs referred to as the White House, are, is this incredible three-dimensional fig figures, you know, the whole thing, the mouth of the, of the great serpent through which you go to get into the inside. Uh, but to photograph that thing properly in a freeze, uh, he had to go along bit by bit by bit by bit by bit by bit and take individual pictures. And then uh, with the computer, he stitched those together because they have protection over them, you know, and things pieces of wood coming yeah, down and, and, and yeah. <laughs> he yeah, figured we, out how to get around that. Yeah, we saw that and it was an interesting experience to be on top and you can see, uh, what was it, Chichen Itza from there? Uh, I don't know, is it Chichen you see? Yeah, yeah, or yeah. is it Isamal? I can't. Uh, no, it's Chichen It's Chichen. And, and what was the other one? There were several. Cobalt. There were several. You, you, can, you can actually, yeah. you can see them. They're, yeah, I mean, they're sticking dots, up above. But, but you, can, you can spot them. And uh, that, that's kind of what's really amazing uh, uh, in terms of uh, a lot of the sites. Uh, it gives you, so they, they can see the others and, and I'm thinking. Well, I know Isamal, uh, which was where Bishop Landa hung, hung out. It's a huge, late pre-classic pyramid, it's very I, early. I, I've been there. And you can see other sites sticking up from there yeah, too. But they're all within a town, which yeah. is, uh, which, that surprised me. Yeah. Uh, actually, we're driving back from Chichen Itza, and it's this archaeological site here. And it's yeah. off the main highway, yeah. and you get to it, and we eventually got there. But it's like a Teokali with another Teokali on top of it. Yeah. When you get to the top of it, it looks like you're on, 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 on ground. But actually, there's a, 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 a platform, yeah. and then to build another pyramid on, on top. If you want to see this kind of stuff, to see sites popping up, uh, northern Guatemala, up on the border with Mexico, just south of the Campeche border, there is this uh, uh, huge site, El Mirador, yeah. 
It's north of Tikal. I, I, I heard you, and you got to be helicoptered in. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you walk in for two days, bringing all your water and all your food, and you walk by, out for two days. By, by mule. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you, or on foot. To, you weren't up to that, huh? No. <laughs> I've done it in the past when I was much younger. No more. What's been the biggest surprise for you of the archaeological sites that you've been to in the last 10 years? Because I still find... I mean, I yeah. haven't gone to everyone, but you've seen probably a lot more than I have. What's been the most surprising thing to you? The most surprising? Well, I say El Merador is one of them. Because uh, the canopy, the jungle canopy there is 150 feet high, approximately, the top of the jungle. It's got wonderful forests there. And uh, the, the biggest pyramid, Danta Pyramid, it's the largest pyramid in the New World and probably the largest pyramid in the entire world. Yeah. Uh, you stand on the top of that and you look at the horizon and you can see other sites like it popping up just above that 150 foot canopy. Huge cities that have hardly been touched. Barely, barely. And touched. also extremely early. This, all this stuff is so you late, late pre-classic, late formative. So you were able to get yourself all the way to the top, huh? Yeah, <laughs> and unfortunately at that point uh, you had to repel yourself down with the ropes. Yeah. Uh, okay. But I made it. I don't know that I could do it now, but that was about, I suppose, about four or five years ago. Okay, so that, that was kind of the big surprise for you. would Yeah. Because that's news, actually, that, that the biggest pyramid in the world yeah. is, is that. It's that there. Much. And even, even what is it, they haven't really... Excavate enough to really see the the actual structure of yeah, it. Yeah, they've they've sort of been trying to stabilize it on top, uh, but it's it's the most enormous site you've ever seen, and the amazing thing is there that um, the construction, these guys didn't know what their limitations were. It's like the old Mac. I mean, they built these you know huge heads and so forth. They had no idea you shouldn't build a head that weighed ten tons. So they went ahead and did it. Well, these people, when they constructed this pyramid out of huge limestone blocks, all sort of squared off, but big, you know, ones like this, instead of putting them like that, sideways going up, they turned them so they, <laughs> they the long axis goes into the pyramid. So they would have had to use two or three times more blocks to do this. On the other hand, the pyramid is totally stable. I mean, nothing could shake it down because it's it's got this, this amazing construction. But, and the causeways, there are causeways that are, you know, two or three times as wide as this room here. Uh, and uh, these things are masonry. And they run not only inside the site of El Mirador, but to a lot of other cities there. I, just, it's just, I don't know how they did it. Yeah. Well, a, a lot of this is being discovered now with the new technology where that with yeah. uh, I forget what it's called, but it's, it's a form of infrared. Uh, no, I'll tell you the latest. Okay. It's, it's called LIDAR, L-I-D-A-R, and it's an acronym for something or other. What it, the L stands for laser, and basically what they do is to send a plane or better a helicopter at about uh, you know maybe three or four hundred, five hundred feet over the whole area, and shoot lasers down there. Laser scanning. And it, it, it looks right through the jungle. Uh, it hits all the construction. You can see popped up like that. They've just done it at Angkor in Cambodia. Uh, I've just gotten those. They've, the only Maya site or Mesoamerican site so far they've used it is in Belize uh, at the site of Caracol, a big site. Uh, that's been reported, but it's an incredible technique. I mean, there's nothing that they can't see with that. So you see the whole city laid out. Now in Angkor, for instance, uh, it looks like the way a, a traditional Chinese city looks. Streets, avenues that you can't see on the ground. And houses going like that. So that will be the future in Mesoamerica, LIDAR. Yeah, as far as uh, uh, right now, that's kind of the, the, what's helping a lot. But like like you're saying uh, about El Mirador, uh, that's going to take what almost like a generation or maybe more to, yeah. to, to deal with that. And but even a, a site like Chichen Itza, I remember I went to it like in the early '70s, and 
uh, before there was even a little town, I think there was a, the, the Mayapan Hotel, and that's all they had. <laughs> that's right. And uh, but I remember walking around. There was all these stones that they hadn't even excavated. And I'll tell you something about Chichen Itza. It's the probably the best known ancient ruin in the New World, and it's uh, the most visited ruin in Mexico, uh, even more than I think Teotihuacan, and. Uh, so it's well known to the tourists. It's very badly known to, to the archaeologists. Um, that, that it's really we, the, the kind of archaeology where we could understand this site, the sequence of building, who was there when people came in, the dating. We know nothing about it. It's, it's, they're still arguing whether the Toltecs really came there or didn't come there uh, from Tula. It's, uh, it's extremely badly known. The Carnegie Institution of Washington was there for 17 years, back until, well, from about 1915 or 20, until they, they left, and then the, the Mexican Institute came in here. The guy who was in charge of all the pottery, and which is the way, what you have to understand, to understand the changes in the sequences, the date buildings and the whole thing, he packed them all into bags. They were all taken into a bodega uh, for storage in Merida. And then he drank himself to death, <laughs> basically. And he, all his notes went on it. And all the little tags that identified each bag of tepalcates there, potsherds, the mice ate them all. <laughs> so nobody so, knows anything about this. But you can still walk through Chichen Itza. And, and you're right. Of the, all the ones I've been, that's the most tourists that, that are going to I've never it. seen a really proper map of Chichen Itza, yeah. where they mapped the whole thing as a place where people lived. We see where all the temples are, yeah, but it, people weren't living in the temples. They were using them. Because yeah, it's more about the, the buildings. We know the buildings. We, we yeah. know about, but the, the history, like you're saying. Like I remember uh, when I went in the 70s, you can see some of the murals. There was no protection for them. None. The, the, for instance, the mural, wonderful murals, Toltec Maya murals in the Temple of the Jaguars up above the, uh, the ball court there. Those have been known for uh, you know, 150 years. Uh, and the wonderful copies were made by Adela Breton, who took these half-scale copies back to England where she lived. And nobody's ever properly published those. Now they're all destroyed. I mean, this, mold and fallen apart and just no protection whatsoever. And those are some of the most important murals ever made in the New World. Yeah. But you can still walk through Chichen Itza and went through Uxmal recently yeah. and you still got stones just piled up oh, yeah. on, on the side and I'm going <laughs> right. you know, it's like, like the, I think the first time I went to Chichen Itza was in the early 70s and I went like middle 70s again by the time I went in the middle of the 70s, they had soldiers on the site. Yeah. So something had happened. <laughs> yeah, right, I'm obviously. Going, I'm going, all right, uh, uh, yeah. they got the soldiers. Uh oh. And you got people following you around. It was still a few people. It, it wasn't as tourists. You're talking about Ushma? Uh, no, I'm talking about Chichen Itza. At Chichen? Yeah, yeah. And, and then, uh, of course, this last time, I hadn't been there for a long time. I, uh, but I went there in. Um, in 2007, mm -hmm. and it was like Disneyland. Oh, yeah. I won't go there now. <laughs> yeah. It's just, I can't, I don't want to go to a place that's being used like that. Yeah. It's a money cow. Yeah, you know, it, it's a touristic it money cow. But that's what angers me about Teotihuacan and, and uh, Chichen Itza. You know there's a lot of money being made, and you don't yeah. see it going at least into that site. Yeah, and I then, suppose you followed the uh, Walmart scandal. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Teo. <laughs> yeah. That, that was, that's outrageous. Were they? Yeah, but, the, but the fact that the people didn't do anything about it, and, and yeah. this kind of again the, with us as an organization, we're working at, on on our our rights as indigenous people to access yeah. our identity and our history yeah. and all this, but. That's we're a tiny percentage who are awake and and who are reading the history. And thanks to like I've told you many times uh, to yourself, and we talked also about Jacques Soustel and Nigel Davies. Yeah, uh, right. Because you made this history very accessible to us, and but that's 
the very few of us, uh, the very few people who are into Mesoamerican worldwide, you know. Yeah, um, that's true. Uh, so for us, it, it's 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 difficult to get the majority of our people, even the Mexican government. We talked about the Mexican government in yeah. an earlier uh, uh, interview. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, like when I was here last time, uh, no. uh, they didn't allow us to videotape because of what happened last time we were here and I asked the, the people from the Templo Mayor, you know, uh, yeah. about uh, when are they going to start removing those buildings so we can have access to Tenochtitlan. Yeah. And they responded, never. Those are the jewels of Mexico. <laughs> so, and, but these are the criollos yeah. that control Mexico. That's and true. I, I guess to a certain extent, they don't want us to know the full history. Um, what's your take on that? Do, do you know what could be done? I mean, uh, of, of interested people, to call them tourists or whatnot, to go to a major site like Chichen Itza is to have a, a good staff of uh, trained guides there who aren't giving you a lot of BS, which they do there. Uh, it's terrible. I've listened to these guys. It's just an outrageous set of <laughs> mentiras that are going on here. You know, it's just something to interest the tourists. Nobody learns anything that way. Not all sites are that way. No. For instance, Palenque, they've got a good bunch of local guys. They really know a lot. They've been to the meetings. They, they, they've studied it and stuff like that. But Ordinarily, you get a big site, and what the Alvan is in another case, like Chichen, with, uh, you know, the, the guys are just giving complete stories uh, yeah, to some these people. Some make up their own. Oh, they, of course, they all make up their own. Yeah. And uh, they haven't read anything, they don't know anything. Yeah. Um, they should have a, a guide school. They should have gone to a guide school where they actually have to read what people have written about yeah. this place. Well, well, I think that's an interesting thing you're saying about the guide. It helps to have a good yeah, guide. Which I, I've, I've gotten guides, like when we went to Ushmal, uh, and, and, uh, and I went, and we, yeah. we, got, we got a guide there. And he was good overall, except then he, he, he kept on quoting the, some of these New Age books. And yeah, they love that. The, yeah. the New Agers all but, come but, there, but, you know. But, but that's, that's their bread and butter is to feed the, <laughs> that's the, the That's exactly New right. So yeah. it was hard to, and he was a Mayan speaker. And yeah. it, it was interesting because we were talking to him about translations and he was saying, oh, it's about the spirituality. What are the, what are the, what are the, are the exact Mayan words? And, yeah. and basically, long story short, uh, the original words, uh, there was no such thing as spirituality. He said, oh, but I translate that as spirituality. <laughs> yeah, right, because that's what the New Agers want to hear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, and no. then we, we uh, were in, uh, Z what's the, the place outside of Media? Uh, Civil Chaltun. Civil Chaltun. We Civil went Chaltun, there, yeah. And we had a Mayan, Mayan guide, and he, we were having a conversation with him, and, and then... Uh, uh, we were trying to explain, yeah, our people, we don't have access to our history and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, well, you know, I used to, I used to burn incense and the gods and all that. But then, then I, I, I really woke up. We thought, oh, okay, so you're more about the knowledge and all that. Yeah. It says, no, uh, the Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> <laughs> Did I, you ever go through Lolton Cave? No, no. Oh, that's really worth visiting. I mentioned that because... Uh, my wife and I, a long time ago, and I think one of our kids was with us, we went to Lulton Cave, and there was a local school teacher there uh, who acted as a guide for us. And it turned out he was a real thing. He was a chamen, a shaman. And uh, we had a long conversation. He'd been reading a lot of stuff going way back to early Harvard exploration there under uh, Edward Thompson, who used to own Chichen Itza. And I, I said, well, do, have you, do you have a copy? I, what do you have? He said, no. I said, I have an extra copy. I'll send you one. And I got his name and his address. And uh, I sent it to him. Whenever I promised to do something to somebody like that, because he was really good, um, I, I fulfilled that promise. Then several years later, I led a Yale tour down there. And we went to Lul Toon. And he was our guide. You know, he came up, come on, I'll take you guys all through. And he took us into places in Lultun Cave where they have the real stuff, where they prophesy every year. He showed us the whole thing, which otherwise we never would have seen. You know, the average person doesn't even know about it. It's a huge cave system. It's enormous. 
system. And they use it today. The, the shamans, the chmen, achmenob, uh, for yearly prophecies, all kinds of stuff. And we got into that through him, just mm -hmm. for the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. he, I befriended him. I mean, he was a friend. Yeah, well, that, well, that was kind of one of the other things that, that we experienced. When we, when we were at Ekbalam, uh, there was a young uh, Mayan person, and his yeah. dad actually had worked on the reconstruction yeah. of the site. And we got into a really good conversation with him, and he was explaining that he didn't know very much of the history. And then we got to a point where I said, well, can you teach us a little bit of the Yucatec? Uh, Mayan, uh, some yeah. key words, and he was good to a certain point. And then I said, "What's the word for sky?" Yeah. And then he stopped. He didn't know it. He didn't know it, and and then. Um, Khan. Yeah, uh, which, <laughs> which I was going to say, yeah, I, I know. No. It. Yeah, and and then uh, he says, "Yeah, th th I mean, we speak it at home, but uh, but then I was trying to think, how could you not?" Yeah, you the younger this? generation doesn't want it. Yeah, yeah, and and that was. Basically, uh, uh, what I've encountered is that's why I, I'm always still cautious about shaman. Which again, that's one of I know it's a generic yeah, term. Yeah, and it's more a Siberian thing. And 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 the other thing is kind of because we get a lot of this. Uh, well, the the last speech of Guatemoc, and it says that we should hide our knowledge and oh, our yeah, yeah. and all. Yeah, that. I know what well, you mean. Well, again, again, yeah. if anybody really knows history, why that's not really possible? Why? Yeah. He, he was hung out in the middle of the, the jungle. That's or, true. It's uh, a So, uh, um, so th that's why when it comes down to what has survived to now to twenty thirteen, yeah, it, is it really anything authentic? Because one of the things that I question is that, like everything seems to have been tied into a warrior society. Yeah. And out of the warrior society, that's where the discipline came in. That's true. That's where the, the so-called priest came out of. Yeah. That's where everything was maintained. And if you don't have that warrior society, do you really have an authentic culture of the Mayan priests? It's out of context. Yeah, we we don't have warriors anymore. That, uh, yeah, whether you're talking about the Sunnis or you're talking about uh, the Mexica or whatever yeah. Mayan cities, yeah. they're not there. We don't have that infrastructure. But what I I do learn is what a lot of our, our people who speak the language who are full blood mm -hmm. and they're aware. They read the books. They, yeah, they give what you want to hear. Yeah. I know. And, and yeah. So, are they really uh, shaman? Are they really priests? And yeah. and especially since we know you go back to the Popol Vuh and they say, "Well, we we we've been Christianized, but we're going to tell you the story." Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we know that was already going on. Yeah. I, I want to talk on. a little bit more because since you mentioned that, I guess the whole thing of what has actually survived of the people yeah. that you, you, that's one person you encountered, uh, and because I, I encountered a lot It's of changing so fast now though. I mean, uh, the, the Lacandon Maya were always considered to be the most, the least acculturated by the Spaniards. That is, they, they hid out, they stayed away from them, they fought them, and that was true until about, you know, 1900 when Alfred Tazer, one of my gurus from Harvard, went down and spent two years with them. Uh, that was really authentic, completely non-Hispanicized Maya. Uh, but I was there not so long ago, uh, leading a, a group from Far Horizons Tours. We had a, a, a chapa store, and uh, we went to, had to go to Bonham Park. And uh, you go now, and <laughs> the Lacandon Maya, or people who say they're Lacandon Maya, mm -hmm. you have to go with them. They control that whole thing now. And uh, uh, they've got pickup trucks and God knows what. And I think the guys with the long hair are now wearing wigs. That is the truth. I suspect that. And they got long white robes. Uh, but this stuff is machine made. I know it's the stuff they bought in the local supermarket. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, our civilization has gotten to them, so they've all got big pot bellies. <laughs> it's, it's really kind of sad, and I doubt if they know any Lacandon Maya at all at this yeah. point. And then again, okay, they survived, not Hispanicized, 
but how much of the knowledge has really actually survived? I don't think a lot has for them. There's yeah. just there's just there's so few of them, and uh, they've been so involved with selling goods, tourist goods at Palenque, coming into Palenque I saw from some at all the Palenque, places. Yeah. Uh, 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 they 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 they've just been overwhelmed. There probably are a few who are still. Still in traditional, but yeah. it's hard to find. Yeah, I, I remember in like the uh, middle 80s, uh, and I was in Nayarit, and I ran across a huichol. Yeah. And he was there uh, to pick up uh, the, the paperwork, because uh, he was the leader for his area. And I got a chance to interview with him, and it, it was an interesting experience. Um, because I have been told, well, they don't speak Spanish. He spoke better Spanish than I did. <laughs> uh, and um, I was interested in the whole dream aspect. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's what I want to, I have people with me, they, they want to talk about the whole peyote thing. Right. Um, but it, it came, came down to, in the conversation, where you were saying, uh, well, I do heal people, uh, but psychologically, they have to believe that I can heal them. Yeah. I'm going, psychologically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then I understood, okay, this is a very sophisticated man. He's a very well-educated man. Yeah. And that's why he's a representative of the Wichotas. He was a young man, maybe yeah. late, late 20s. And what he said is, yeah, we do the rituals and ceremonies, but we don't really understand most of but it's all we got left. Yeah. Um, and I told him about the way they dress. You know, I've seen pictures you know, from the early 1900s, 1800s, right. and you guys didn't dress like this. What what is what what is, what's the story behind this? And then he says, "Well, th we look at this as as a shield. You refer to it yeah. as a shield. We know people make fun of us and all, all that. Yeah. And I thought that was the most honest of all yeah. the people that I've ever talked to. I talked to the local, the, the the local chiefs around here, yeah. and I, they can come up with one story one summer, and then the next summer they got another origin story. Yeah, and." Um, I, I think part of the problem is instead of just saying, I don't know, the, the, they'll yeah. go and read a book and pretend that they, this has been oral. There are a lot of people like that, yes. And uh, no, no. I mean, it, it, I'm curious about the one that you, you did find. What, what were the things, that, this one that you were. The one I'm talking about with Little Tone Cave? No, no, oh. actually, fill me in a little bit on that. Yeah. Well, that's a guy I told you who. Uh, uh, took us into, because I had sent him all this stuff about the cave, uh, et cetera, from the you know, old Harvard publication. He felt that I was an honest person that he could take with this group of people I had and took us into stuff that no other tourist ever sees there. Oh, okay. so, uh, so it was more about... Uh, it's Se more about secret places that he knew, yeah, uh, yeah. not so much about knowledge. They do have these people. They, they're, they're, there's a lot of these people in the Yucatan Peninsula, but uh, uh, you're not going to see them on a, on a tourist trip. But when it comes to ceremonies, like the Chachak ceremony that goes on every year, uh, which is an agriculture thing, they're there. They have to be there. And they drink ceremonial drinks and have ceremonial tortillas, special kinds of food. That's when they tie uh, four little boys. They've got a, a, like an altar you know, made out of sticks all tied together, like a table. And on each corner, they, they tie little boys. And they have to make this sound, uh, which is go, wah, wah, wah. That's the sound of a certain kind of frog. The really awful looking thing called a wo, and it signals the coming of the rains. You go into some of these, uh, up in the, say, in the, I've heard this at Tikal when the rains came, they come by the thousands and thousands. Uh, as soon as it rains, they're looking for mates. So the males are calling to them, and it's deafening. Your ears just tingle listening to this. So that's why they have those four little boys making that noise. Uh, to call up the rains. They still do that. So, they so, still so, do so that. So it's more like traditions, rituals that they've been able to hang on. They're very old rituals. Yeah. This yeah. is an ancient agricultural ritual for the coming of the rains. But, but, you know, looking forward to the planting of the corn because it's been a long dry season 
and they have put the corn in the ground, the seeds, uh, after they've burned the, the milpa, and they're, they're, they're calling up the rains. It's like the, in Santo Domingo Pueblo on August 4th, out in the, you know, south of New Mexico. Every, they have their so-called festival, the Santo Domingo. It's really a rain festival. And uh, uh, a mixing of Christianity. It's, and have you any of you seen that? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's incredible. I mean, when I was there a number of years ago with my wife and kids, there were there were four hundred dancers and two long lines, two hundred on a side, you know, drumming up with their feet the clouds, and uh, the, the the two kivas there at either end of the plaza and a sort of a nervous looking Catholic priest there, you know, what, what's going on here. Uh, and I saw that over the Hamas Mountains, this little cloud, like about this big, blue sky, got bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the time we left to, to go to our campground, it was pouring rain with lightning and thunder, which is what that was all about. Right before your eyes. Right before, and I'm going back this summer. I'm thinking going with one of my, my kids and his, his two children. Uh, and we're going down and we're be at Santa Domingo on August 4th. It's, and all these people come in from other pueblos to trade at that point. You can, you know, they're trading uh, turquoise necklaces and all kinds of stuff. It's a real thing. Just uh, kind of general, uh, what, what do you see as far as uh, the future of archaeology in terms of um, how it could help indigenous people throughout the whole Western Hemisphere as they learn more about what, what it is that is our history, yeah. what it is that, that we can make for the future of our people. Is that uh, anything? Well, that there, 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 there really has to be put into the school system. Wherever you have a large uh, of, of indigenous population, let's say from the Maya area or from Oaxaca or anywhere. Or, or East L.A. Yeah, well, East L.A., New Haven, Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I used to have in the, the, the museum there at Yale is the Peabody Museum of Natural History. And I used to have a big exhibit there because uh, I was a curator for many, many years there that covered the whole new world south of the Mexican border down to Tierra del Fuego. And it called it Mexico to Peru. And we have great collections. Uh, so it went and explained all of that. Uh, so the, and their wisdom, the authorities eventually, when I retired, uh, took the whole thing out and put the museum shop in. You know, a schlock shop to sell mm -hmm. junk to everybody for Christmas and one. There's no place now in that museum for all of the people who have come up there from Guatemala and Mexico to show their children uh, their past, you know, and to be proud of it. And I am so angry at this point at them, you know. To, well, well, let me share with you a bigger anger. There's something that is being planned called the Latino Museum. Where's that going to be? In Washington, D.C. Yeah. And this Latino Museum, they start talking about how it begins in 1492. Yeah, obviously. And the, 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 the crime, the, the genocide of this is that this is meant for in the majority of our people who are indigenous people. Yeah. And they're right. promoting uh, Columbus and the, the explorers Obviously, as, yeah. as heroes. <laughs> and, uh, and the sad part is a lot of our people are going along with this because they, they bought into the Latino identity. The yeah, Hispanic I know. Now identity. they're politically strong. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. well, you got the Cubans it's controlling, all votes. controlling Spanish language TV. Yeah. So they put the white faces. They, and of course, you got uh, the the women wanting to dye their hair. You got the, <laughs> the, the 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 dyeing of the skin and yeah. the, the bleaching of the skin and yeah. all, all of these kind of things. Uh, uh, no. And then on the other hand, you go to the Museo de Antropología uh, in Mexico City, yeah. and uh, again, the way everything is portrayed, it's it's there, but it's not in a way to say. This is our pride. This it's is not going to mean anything to anybody to whom it should mean something to. It, it, exactly. And yeah. that's in Mexico City where yeah. we got millions of indigenous people. Yeah. And they can go there and say, mira yeah. que bonito, or mira que feo, or right. whatever. 
Because there's no, no, like the guy that you're talking about, there's nobody there to guide them. I know. When they, when they, when they enter the, the, the museum, there isn't like a video that show, this was Tenochtitlan. This was Tenochtitlan. Yeah. yeah. This, this was the, the greatness of all of this. They usually get movie stars to narrate those things. Yeah. From the old days, it used to be Pedro Armendariz yeah. used to be the the speaker speaking for the Maya or the Aztec. Yeah. He never saw a Maya or an Aztec in his life. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but again, the the thing is, if you're not getting out of the Museo de Antropología, where there's all this beautiful stuff, yeah, people go in there and it's just wallpaper. There's no connection to it. I know. Uh, and now they're doing this Latino museum. Um, and we're, we're telling people to look at Lemkin's definition of genocide. Yeah. And, and it is genocide, what's yeah, going on, because we, our identity is being taken away from us. Or at least uh, ethnocide, but oh, it's yeah. genocide, too. Yeah, it, it, it's it's yeah. both, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, so having these beautiful books and obviously lots of other yeah. books, we talk to people about you know, all the, the sources that are available now that you can buy. We got, we got several of the codices, you know. Uh, what you have to do, though, is to get the really young people. Get, you know, because what's happening, for instance, uh, north of the border among um, American Indian peoples uh, is that the younger generation, they, they, they've, they're losing the language. All these languages are dying out now. I mean, California used to have something like 50 or 60 different languages. And you get one old lady can still speak it, and then she yeah. dies. That's the end and of that's it. That's the end of it. Because the young people, you know, they're looking at television all the time, or, you know, they're, or now with their computer games, <laughs> they, yeah. they, 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 yeah. they don't well, want to do well, it. My, my answer to, to this thing is uh, well, so long as the Criollos control Mexico, so long yeah. as the Cubans control Spanish language That's uh, right. media, we're going to have this genocide ongoing. Yeah. And uh, sadly, the few of our people who go into your field right. uh, have no empathy for, for their own people. Yeah. Uh, they're just capitalizing. They're just one the tenure. They're tourists, too. The, the tenure, and that's why we love you so much, because <laughs> well, he's, a, he's a European, but he obviously loves the subject, and there, there are yeah. other people like yourself, yeah. and, uh, but we can't get them even out of Mexico City. When I talk to the historians out of the UNAM, and in a lot of ways, they're more Eurocentric than the Europeans that I I'll tell about. you a story. Years and years ago, uh, when I, I guess I was already hired at Yale, but uh, I have a very good library in this stuff, and I collect dictionaries, especially Maya and Nahuatl dictionaries of all sorts. And I went into a bookstore in Merida. This was years ago. Uh, they sold books. I sold all kinds of stuff. And there was this sort of teenage, chip on the shoulder kind of guy there. Uh, and I said, do you have any Maya dictionaries? He said, what are they? I said, well, the dictionaries of the Maya language. He says, who's interested in that? You know, he, he told me I was wasting my money. I said, the only reason why I am here is that I want to learn Maya and I want to know more about the Maya. Not about you or your people, but about the Maya. He just like that. Yeah, no, we found this, I mean, it's a modern, a, a thick old Yucatec uh, dictionary in Valladolid. Violin. Violin, yeah. Uh, and then, Saki, the old name. <laughs> yeah, and, and then the, the other thing, we, we went into Merida and had a similar experience to yourself. Yeah. I forget what, what we were looking for in this. Now you bought a whole bunch of books, and I bought a whole bunch of books. Mexico Profundo. Mexico Profundo. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in Merida, they had never heard. Never of, heard of it. Uh, of uh, Mexico Profundo or, or, or uh, uh, Bonfil Batalla. Yeah. And I'm going. <laughs> uh, okay, I uh, know, and, and that's part of the problem. And and Dr. Ko, uh, we've run out of time here, but we're go we're going to exploit you along the way. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time. <laughs> no, no, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna give you a right to the hotel. Okay, and then we're we're gonna <laughs> keep gonna, on going. Keep on going. Yeah, you know? why not? Uh, All right. All right. Uh, you know how to say let's go in Maya? Uh, no. Kosh. 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 Gosh. Gosh.